Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Marr. I'm with the Cornell Small Farms Program where I manage research and extension projects uh, on soil health, reduced tillage practices, and, and vegetable production. Um, welcome you all to today's webinar on pairing tarping with cover crops, getting both on the menu. I, myself and my, uh, my partner, Peyton Janakis here at the University of Maine, are, are happy to invite you to this conversation where we have uh, two uh, excellent farmers joining us to share their perspective on, on how tarps are fitting into their farm and how it's changing the way that they're managing their operation. Um, but uh, really, this is part of a, a larger effort where we um, do research and facilitate uh, farmer to farmer networking on practices such as tarping and others uh, so that you can um, take the knowledge that, that uh, and the experience from, from others on, in their operation and apply it to your own farm. Um, and today I'm going to bring in uh, Ben Stein from Edible Uprising Farm in Troy, New York, and Janice Siller from Adama in Falls Village, Connecticut. Uh, the plan is the two of them will have about 20 minutes, and then we'll leave 20 minutes for questions and really try to field those questions from all of you to get these ideas out and what's on your mind. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to cycle through some logistics, pretty straightforward. Just to keep it all clean, we're going to ask you to stay muted and your video to be off throughout the webinar. Please do use the chat, throw your questions in there. We're going to hold all the questions for the end after the two talks, and then we'll jump right into them. Use the chat as much as you can um, to get those questions out when they come to you. And yes, we are recording this. Um, similar to our previous webinar, this will be available on the Small Farms Program YouTube channel. So hopefully that, that is there within the week. And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, our, our funding sources. All of our work, both research and extension, are supported um, through grants such as the USDA, National, uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture Program. Northeast SARE is funding both these farmer-to-farmer -farmer conversations as well as research in Maine and New York. Uh, trialing tarping practices side by side, and also the Northeast IPM Center that's funding more of a regional approach to thinking about how uh, we can collaborate across not just Maine and New York, but across the Northeast when it comes to tarping and, um, and practices that work for you. So with that, Ben, I'm going to ask you to share your screen. Okay. There we go. Is it up? We, All right. It looks good. I'm going to turn my video off so that we don't clog the airwaves at all here. Great. Take it away, Ben. All right. So my name is Ben Stein. Uh, I run Edible Uprising Farm with uh, my wife, Alicia. Uh, and we are located in Troy. Um, we're on our third land, third year on leased land. Um, the fact that we're on leased land has really affected a lot of our decision making in terms of how we uh, operate our farm. Uh, we're right about at one acre. We're very biointensive, so we do a ton of bed flips, a lot of greens, but we also do a lot of long-term crops. So we do a lot of potatoes and squash and things that most people on our scale may not think about um, think about doing. Uh, we also do a lot of flowers. Uh, we run on a permanent, res based, uh, permanent raised bed system uh, using minimal tillage. Uh, we are not certified, but we do use organic methods. Uh, we run an 80 share CSA with a farm stand, uh, some restaurants, and then it's just my wife and I, although this year we're gonna hire one uh, sort of part-time person, hopefully. Um, so in terms of our farm layout, uh, it's really, um, I'm showing you this just because it's affected the way that we've used tarps. Uh, the acre is split up into sort of 12 different equally sized sections. And so it really helps with our rotation to move everything around, uh, sort of like little jigsaw pieces. 
but it also means that we've sized our tarps to fit these different blocks so that they're really movable. Uh, and so we manage them. We have tarps that fit the whole sort of 50 by 60 foot block. So each one of those is 50 feet by 60. Uh, and we have 50 foot long beds with 15 uh, beds per block. Uh, and so we've got our tarp size to either be a full block. So uh, like 55 by 60. Uh, and then we have ones that cover half a block. And then we also use tarps to just cover a couple beds at a time. So we've trimmed them down to uh, just 10, 10 feet. Uh, so on our farm, our main objectives that we use tarps for is for termina terminating and managing cover crops. Uh, we regulate our soil moisture and temperature to sort of make sure that our planting windows can be achieved. So it's a lot of like if a big storm is coming, we'll put down a tarp to hold it so it doesn't get too wet and uh, we can just manage it. Those are the main two things I'm going to sort of talk about today uh, and talk about. But the other three sort of things that we do. Uh, we use them a lot to reduce the weeds with just two of us. We're not looking to be on our hands and knees weeding uh, and tarps have been really helpful with that. Uh, we are firm believers in trying to keep the soil sort of armored uh, as long as we can or as much as we can throughout the season. And so we, when we're not able to cover crop or mulch in other ways, we use uh, the tarps to provide that armor. And then in, in starting our farm, we uh, use uh, tarps extensively at the in our first season to, to break ground. So first off, uh, so managing cover crops with sort of the more summer cover crops. So we do a lot with peas and oats, and then we'll do buckwheat. Uh, and so in this picture here, we got the zinnias in the front, but then you'll see we got peas and oats sort of in, in the two beds next to it, row rime, and then more peas and oats next to it. Uh, and so we try to get the peas and oats to be pretty far along, usually a little before flowering. Uh, it sort of depends. The great thing about tarps is that uh, you don't need to wait for certain stages to terminate them. Um, but there's a picture of sort of what it was before we tarped. Uh, so we grow them out to be pretty, uh, pretty good size. We mow them. It's, uh, we don't have a flail mower, so I usually just use a weed whacker, um, which isn't great. You know, green, you know, the, the material sort of goes off into the beds next to it. And so we're trying to figure that out uh, a little bit. But um, so in this situation, we mowed it and then we threw, oops, we threw two, threw a tarp on it that covered just those two beds. So again, on our 50 foot system, that tarp we have, and we're four foot on center. So that tarp was 10 feet by 50 feet, super manageable. Uh, we left it on for just about three weeks. Uh, and then we ended up with this really nice, uh, really nice bed here. This, uh, this picture shows it. we kind of messed up the timing on this, but it showed what it looked like underneath the tarps and we'd hoped to plant into this, uh, but we did not manage to do that. Um, but it ended up being really, really nice soil. So in that, we actually ended up just tarping that over winter and using it uh, in the spring. And then so with buckwheat, we sort of have to do the same thing. We'll, you know, we'll grow the buckwheat out, uh, either probably usually mow it, that will, you know, let uh, bloom, right before it goes to seed, we'll mow it, tarp it. And I've found with the buckwheat, uh, especially in the summer, because it's so hot, we've only, we only have to keep the tarps on it for about like 10 days, a little, up, a little longer than a week. Um, and we can, we, once we take that tarp off of there, uh, we'll usually do fall planting uh, on top of that cover crop. Um, and then in this one, you can all see, we sort of do three beds of um, greens at a time. So we'll do like a mescaline, arugula, and a salad mix. And so you can sort of see in the back, block of that picture there that uh, we sort of move in three block or three bed increments in our greens blocks. Um, and then so with winter rye, it's a somewhat different system. Um, this has really helped to be huge with our no-till system with us moving more towards minimal tillage. Uh, and so here we've got some uh, no-till transplanted cucumbers. And so the way that we run that, um, so here's a picture in sort of late April. This was taken before, a little bit before we tarped it. The great thing about tarps for us is that we don't need to wait for, you know, boot stage. So that, so, you know, so we don't need to roll and crimp. Um, you know, we can let it grow up. We don't even have to mow it. We'll throw the tarp on it sort of at any time. Uh, and it can help us with our, our planting window. Um, you know, so we can time things pretty well. Uh, and so this was what, we looked like sort of a week before uh, we tarped it. The rye in this situation ended up being somewhere around eight inches. So in no, no, you know, so in no ways was it maximizing the potential of that rye, 
but it you know gave us the armor over the winter kept soil kept uh, some bioactivity in the soil over the winter and uh in the spring and then in this picture this was the best sort of that i had the the block i'm talking about is on the far right you can just sort of see the corner of the um, of the tarp there uh, and so that's you know that's what it looked like after we tarped right after we tarped it um, and then here's a little video of me pulling the tarp off. Um, so the way that we have our tarp size, I'm able to manage them pretty much by myself. Uh, it's always easier with two people, but um, I can do it by myself. But you can see once we got this, tilt was super nice, soil was super nice, uh, and it really made for a, a great situation where we could just plant right into it. Um, and so in this block, uh, we, in the fall, fully prepped this bed. So we, we amended it before we planted the rye in the fall. Uh, you know, I think it was probably somewhere in October. Fully amended the beds, got them pretty all ready. We mulched the paths. We used a lot of leaves in the paths. So we did all that work in the fall uh, and then let it, let it over winter grow and then tarped in the spring. And so then with this, with the cucumbers, we just went in and we didn't need a trowel, didn't need anything. Uh, we just planted right into it. The tilts was super, super nice. Uh, we have found kind of at the edges when, we, when we've done this, the uh, edges of the blocks where water seems to always kind of settle in because we're on permanent raised beds. Uh, sometimes we get some pretty good compaction on the edges of the bed. So we'll sometimes sort of broad fork, uh, broad fork the edges to break up some of that. Um, but it ended up being, this has really been a great system. We throw a drip on it. And then here's a picture of them on the left uh, in July. And this bed, this bed really, really cranked. The cucumbers were, the cucumber beetles were, were pretty brutal last year, but uh, that bed was great. And then on the right there, we had garlic there. And then that's uh, sort of some fall beets and carrots that we seeded in after that. Uh, so with the soil moisture and so regulating the soil mo moisture and temperature, um, this is really, sort of as this was our first sort of uh, uh, epiphany of sorts, I guess, with with using tarp that's helped us so much um, is that in the, you know, in the fall, we plan out our, our sort of spring, our next year blocks. Uh, and so we use tarps to hold those sort of early blocks um, so that we can plant really early into the spring the next year. Uh, and so this is a bed where we were going to be planting onions in the following spring. And so we do a full block of onions. We grow lots and lots of alliums. Um, so we fully prep them, bring compost. We use uh, the Crayer's chicken manure uh, pellets on top of that. Spread it. We'll put leaves down in the path. Uh, I run, we use the BCS uh, precision depth roller. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but it's been hands down one of the greatest tools we've got. Uh, we basically use it as a tilter. That little mechanism on the back lets you raise and lower it. Uh, and so we just try to disturb the top couple inches of the soil. Um, and so I, we just we get it fully prepped, raked, uh, take the precision depth roller, uh, leaves down, and then throw a tarp over it. And then once that tarp is down, you know, it, it's, we just you know, let it sit there. And then in the spring, we pull back the tarp. If it feels like it needs broad forking, which sometimes uh, we have definitely had that experience where the snow or you know whatever the weight sitting on top of the tarp, uh, you know it sort of has a definitely it's been difficult to plant a couple of these beds. So sometimes we need to broad fork it, sometimes not. Rake it out and plant it. So this was a block of onions uh, that really really worked. It worked really really well. You know the soil warms up uh, quicker under those tarps, so it sort of opened up our planting window that the plants were in there going super happy um, worked out really well. And so the last thing was just sort of regulating moisture. In this picture, you can see all the rain and the paths there. We've used tarps quite a bit. Uh, if we've got an area prepped, haven't planted it, big storm is coming. Again, our tarps are small enough that it's not a huge amount of work to pull them over the, um, the blocks that are gonna get planted, even if it's just overnight uh, for a storm. Uh, and then the next day we can pull it off and the soil's in the same, you know, in a pretty much the same condition we left it and can, can get in there and plant without it doing any damage. Uh, and so last time there were some, last week, there were some sort of tips and management strategies that uh, 
seem to come up over and over again. Uh, with tarping, rodents are a big problem. Uh, we've certainly noticed that whenever we pull back tarps, there's tunnels going everywhere underneath the soil. Uh, and so our the best thing we can do is we have we trained our dog, an old Dutch Shepherd, Belgian Malinois, uh, who has a very strong hunting instinct. Uh, as we're pulling the tarps back, she's just scanning it. Uh, and, and she's she'll get three, four, five of them, you know, because you pull that tarp back and they're, those guys are pretty freaked out. Um, and so the dog has been our method. There's no real other way to do it. It's really, it's a, it's a tough problem. Um, in terms of sort of storage, uh, we really try to fold all of our tarps uh, in the exact same way um, so that we know where to position, position it in the field uh, when we're uh, unrolling it. Um, and so we, you know, every time we'll usually do a couple half folds and then a tri-fold and then try to leave one of the corners up so that we uh, can see the label that we put on all of the corners. Um, so again, because we use different sizes, we use ones that are 50 feet by, that should be 32 feet, not inches, <laughs> but 50 feet by 32, which is essentially a half a block. We use some that are 50 by 60 feet, which is, uh, one of our full blocks and then we use 10 foot by 55 foot. Um, and so we, again, different size tarps. Uh, so those are the three different sizes that we generally find ourselves using uh, that's, that have been really functional for various uses. You know, mid season, we use a lot of the 10 foot ones and the 30 foot ones. And then for overwintering, we use a lot of the bigger, the bigger tarps. Um, and let's see, so then with the wind, that's definitely the probably the biggest annoying thing that everybody uh, deals with with these tarps. Um, and so our strategy has been trying to seal the edges the best that we can. We've sort of played around with uh, sandbags, obviously. We tried T-posts to seal it. Heard of people trying to use the rebar, which, which works, but on any sort of scale, that's you know obviously kind of a ridiculous thing to do. Um, so, uh, and then the other thing is that using raised beds like we are, the tarps really need to be a little bit longer than your growing space. You know, those sorts of humps and undulations in the raised beds, if you're not on the other side of that undulation, uh, you create a pretty serious wind tunnel. Uh, and that's always the place where uh, we see the tarps get ripped up. Um, and so we've also had quite a bit of failures. Moving the tarps around is a bummer. Uh, and so no matter what I've tried to do, it's there's always been some difficulty. So that picture on the left there, that's just what it looks like sometimes. Um, a picture in the top right, we got one of our tarps from uh, used from a local farm here. It was 400 by 60. Uh, and somehow in communicating with him about the tarp, I thought that we'd be able to manage it. We got it into the truck with his tractor. We did not at the time have a tractor here. And we couldn't get it out of the truck. It was stuck in the truck. So we tried tying it to trees, pulling it. It did not. We couldn't do anything. It was totally stuck in the truck. And it was a, it was a ridiculous situation. Uh, but we ended up getting it out. And we ended up cutting that one into all the various sizes that we needed on our farm. Uh, and then that picture in the bottom right, that's just what it looks like in March with the wind. We go out there, and the tarps are all twisted up and, uh, and up. And it's the reality. And we have not figured out how to deal with it yet. Um, and then we do have some concerns with tarping. And I think that, the, you know, we've, we're trying to figure out sort of some more research that goes into, into it. Uh, we, you know, we're worried that the tarps are creating some anaerobic soil conditions that might be breeding some har more harmful bacteria. Um, and depending on our situation, sort of, you know, if it's, if it's uh, uh, we, we, we don't know. And it's just something that we're trying to keep our eye on. We haven't noticed the soil health in any way being affected by tarping, but it's just sort of conceptually something that we're, we're sort of worried about. Uh, and then inevitably, you know, the, the degradation of the, of the tarp having so much plastic, we're not, we're not into that. And so, uh, you know, it's just something we're concerned about. But at this point, the benefits of the tarps have sort of outweighed those other things. And so we've, um, we think about it, we're just working on it, but we haven't uh, come to any real conclusions. Uh, and then, you know, just the main stress of having tarps out there all winter. Uh, the, whenever there's a windstorm, if, the, if we have a period of snow melt and they're exposed, whenever it's windy, we're looking out the window and it's like, 
it's just one of those things on your mind that, um, you know, it's just another thing to add to the list of worries that uh, we try not try to avoid those, but it's just another one. And um, so, so I think I did pretty good there. I think that's about it. Got any other questions that we don't cover anything? Feel free to email me. Um, this is a bed here that we, this was tarped for about six months and we did not, uh, we haven't, we didn't weed this bed once, these, this block once. It was a, it was a tremendous tarping success. Uh, and so that's always our goal. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, Jana, I'm going to just turn it right over to you so we can keep rolling. We do have some questions in the chat. We'll get to those. Uh, hopefully, um, more will come in for, for Ben. And uh, as Jana's talking, please put your questions in the chat. And we will get to all of them in the last 20 minutes. Jenna, take it away. Looks like we may have Frozen Jana, as she was trying to share her screen. So as we wait for her to come back, I think we should. Let's give her another minute here. Give her a minute to come back in and we'll just take the top question maybe from Ben. Uh, ben, are, are you with us? As, yeah. as Janet tries to come back in. Yeah. Um, the top question is where are you fitting cover crops into your veg rotation? So how uh, are you fitting them to the rest of your rotation? Yeah, so the, I mean, there, you know, we, we really try to plan it out so that the in the mid season, the cover crops in our rotation are going on the blocks that we know are going to have some bed turnovers. Um, and so, you know, if we have like an early greens block uh, where we've got a, or, you know, radish, we got um, something in the ground for uh, a month, let's say, we'll usually try to run a summer cover crop in those beds, we either do a buckwheat or a peas and oats or something. Um, and then we'll try to, we'll plan time, try to time that out so that then in the fall we can get another greens, um, succession into that. So it's essentially, you know, so in that, in that case, we would have three, three sort of plans for three, uh, three crops planned for those beds. Um, and it's tricky on such a small scale. We, you know, it, it's tricky. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to, um, sort of prioritize the cover crops when we know we could plant another another you know more greens in there but we try to prioritize as much as we can uh, Peyton did you have any questions that you had uh, singled out that we could start with I just had a question after looking at that last photo that you shared. Were there any weeds at all when you started farming on that land? <laughs> like, was it a very weedy place to begin with? I'm just kind of yeah, amazed. So, yeah, so to start it, uh, so again, we're on leased land. It had been just a mowed field for 40 years. They hadn't grazed it. It was basically just a meadow. They mowed it once in the spring, once in the fall. And so when we first got there, there was a tremendous uh, grass seed bank uh, wow. of all Luckily, not too many rhizomious grasses, so it wasn't like a total nightmare. Um, but uh, there were a lot, there's a lot of weed seed. And in the areas, so that block we um, covered or we kept the tarp on for six, eight months. Uh, in the other places where the tarp was only on for like the standard sort of three weeks as we were um, getting things going, those blocks had tons of weeds. And then this one did not. Uh, but yeah, there were weeds. That looked incredible. All right, let's take a pause here and see if we can get Jana back. Hi, everyone. You should, be able to, you should be able to share your screen now. Great. 
be it. Yeah, I got got bumped off for some reason. Okay. Um, so that was so great, Ben. Thank you. Um, really helpful. Um, and really, yeah, similar findings to what we've experienced here. So I'm Jana Siller at Adama. We're a farm up in Falls Village, Connecticut. It's the Northwest corner. So we're kind of in the Berkshires and our farm, we do a lot of things, including educational programs. We have a residential fellowship. We're at the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center. Um, so we have all kinds of educational um, and community life things going on. Um, and we, our farm itself has, um, you know, it has a permaculture component and a, um, uh, we're planting an agroforestry project of chestnut trees and we have some, um, we make our own compost and um, there's all kinds of things we do, but we also have a um, production farm, vegetable farm business. So we have about three acres in production and we are growing for mostly for our CSA locally here in the region and also for um, the Isabella Friedman Retreat Center dining services. And we have something we call the Food Access Fund where we fundraise to um, provide food um, for food pantries and other partner organizations in food access work. Um, and we make value added products, pickles and jams. So we have a lot going on, but today I'm gonna talk about the vegetable production um, and specifically our reduced tillage and our tarping. So the first tarping that we ever did was this project. And I bought this big tarp and we tried just terminating um, cover crops with it. So in this case, I had a, a area that was rye and vetch. And um, for us, our rye always um, gets to its seed production stage a little earlier than the vetch flowers. So I always uh, mow it and the rye um, dies back from the mowing and the vetch flowers, um, which is you know, the, be the best moment to terminate it. And so we put, just put a tarp without actually mowing the, the vetch here um, in June. This was a couple of years ago and just put the tarp right on and then moved the tarp off uh, about, let's see, probably a month and a half later and planted fall brassicas into it and that, um, that worked really well. So here's an example. Actually, there were two plots that we did it in. Um, and so you can see the first plot that we did where this, this mostly died on the left and then we kind of moved it over to some much older vetch. Um, and that whole thing worked pretty well, but you can see that our farm is actually really well suited to these big tarps because we have these big crews of um, helpers around and um, it can be a lot easier to move the tarps um, with, with a lot of people. This was another experiment I did with solarizing, not with, with the opaque tarps, but I just wanted to see what would happen if I made like a little tunnel with greenhouse plastic for rye. Um, so that was not a very successful use of plastic on the farm, um, but I have had a lot more success at, um, well, I mean, just cause what it, what it did to the rye was really elongate it and, um, uh, not really, yeah, just made it, made it sort of, um, struggle. <laughs> um, but I have used these clear plastic tarps, um, for just killing really, you know, young, young weeds that come, come up and that works pretty well. Um, so something that I want to use tarps for, um, that we're sort of still experimenting with is, is, or that I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the role of tarps is gonna be for us. Um, this is an example of our cover cropping. We have rye and you can see it's, it's made its seed head and then we have crimson clover and vetch. And um, one strategy we've been doing because we're, we're trying to till less is whack it down with a weed whacker like Ben talked about doing too. Um, so this is, this is that same cover crop just whacked down and then we planted directly into it. This is winter squash. And I was amazed because it was just such a mess of a, of a plot <laughs> with um, you know rye coming back and there's some purslane there. And yet we compared it with a plot where we um, did the, you know, just traditionally tilled in our cover crop and then planted 
winter squash and we got the same yield in both places, which was really interesting. So this year, I think I'm going to do the same process in an area, but um, it's just the timing is pretty tight, but I think I'll put a tarp on it for um, hopefully we'll have about two weeks to put a tarp on it um, and that will hopefully knock back some of this other stuff. Um, so, and we've gotten some support for our reduced tillage from um, Berkshire Ag Ventures here in the region and the um, CSP program, which if folks haven't done it, there's a, in, um, an enhancement incentive for, um, for reduced tillage. There's lots of different enhancements you can do. But um, that has, um, uh, that's gonna allow us to buy a flail mower, which we, I'm hopeful that sort of flail mowing in this stage here um, is gonna also be pretty effective for planting directly into cover crops. Um, so here's another example of the big tarps. Um, we've gotten a few more since then. This was an example where what we did actually is we tilled in our rye and vetch cover crop and then we, um, it rained and we sort of let a bunch of weeds sprout and then we tarped um, before planting our fall cover crops. And the goal there was just to like fully stale seed bed it. Um, and I still found that we had more weeds when we did that than we did when we planted right into the cover crop residue that we killed with tarps. So um, I don't think I would do this again. Um, we have just, we have a lot of um, little annual weed weeds that the less we till, the um, easier they are to deal with, I find. But yeah, so this is on the right is the same field um, after. And you can see again, our, um, you know, we have, we have lots of people and most of the people who are here on the farm during the season um, don't have agricultural training. So um, not a lot of tractor driving, um, but for, for our farm tarps are sometimes a good fit because we do have hands um, that maybe wouldn't be able to do, um, you know, if we had a more expensive piece of equipment um, that one individual could drive um, for us, it actually sometimes makes sense to use tarps, but I do think that's a big drawback of tarps. We do spend a lot of time moving sandbags around. Um, we often use steel, um, like eight inch uh, ground staples um, because we, um, I'll get to this a picture in a little bit, but we sometimes use the permeable landscape fabric, which is much cheaper and a lot easier to kind of move around. Um, and then we use the ground staples, but it's a lot of time. Um, so still with the big tarps, um, we took one into the high tunnel last winter um, and we're able to get into the soil really early this spring. Um, you can see this is the pulled back um, tarp. Now, I didn't love it because normally I grow cover crops in the tunnel and that year we just had stuff going um, really far into the fall. This year it's full of spinach. Um, so if I'm not going to grow overwintered greens in a tunnel, um, I'd rather get a cover crop in there. It's a little, it's, it's kind of a, um, yeah, it's a balance because the tarps really allow you to get into the soil a lot sooner, whether it's in a tunnel or out. Like right now, I'm really excited to be able to be seeding directly into ground that's just ready to go from being tarped all winter. But at the same time, um, it doesn't allow us to cover crop. And then there really is this issue, especially because we're on a fairly gentle slope, but it's still a slope. Um, I just worry about like when it's raining, you can see, you can imagine in a big rain event, it's just such a huge <laughs> impervious surface um, for water to be flowing off down. So that's one drawback. And the way that we've, oh, and this is an example of after that um, tarp came up, we um, just direct seeded onto the sides of the beds and then planted the tomatoes straight down the middle. Um, so, but the direction we're moving with tarps is actually, um, uh, this, these are silage tarps that we cut into three foot strips um, and then we leave the paths open. And you can't really tell here because this, I took this picture yesterday and everything's just barely, um, getting green around here, but um, we do have living mulch paths here. So it's, um, 
it looks like just a total mess over here, but it actually is um, a bed of carrots and then a bed of grass. And the trick with the living mulch pads for us is really mowing them every week. So just staying on top of mowing them. So we're in the process right now of transitioning our fields to three foot, well, 30 inch beds, but three foot wide tarps and 21 inch wide paths. And the reason for that is that we have a 21 inch wide mower. Um, and I'm, I've, yeah, I've had some luck and I'm hopeful that it'll work on a larger scale on the rest of our farm in having the tarps strips be wider than the bed to try to keep the edges of the path in check. So we can't run the mower down the path while we have um, the, tarp down because we'll we'll catch the edge of the tarp but when the tarps are up and the crops are growing then we can mow the paths um, and the tarps will actually sort of keep the edges of the pad living mulch pads in check um, and so right now we only have this on probably like 1 20th of the farm um, these living mulch pads and then this spring we're in the process of setting it all up so a bunch of these most of these that we do are actually the permeable landscape fabric um, tarps and so those are already coming in those strips and all our beds are 100 feet long um, so we have these three foot wide 100 foot long strips that we can put down again it's a lot of time to ground staple each bed individually compared to pulling a big tarp over the whole thing but I'm much less concerned with sort of the erosion and and um, issues that we have on our slopes um, when we have the living mulch pads. And then, of course, there's some biological activity in the path um, that I'm excited about. Here's just an example of an alternative to a tarp that didn't work for us. I did some experimenting with um, cardboard mulch, like on a big scale, like 100 foot beds of um, big strips of cardboard. And these are um, just ground nesting wasps that um, made their nests in there. We had several of these with the cardboard. So plastic. I, the goal of it was really to try to find if we could have some alternatives to plastic for the same concerns that Ben mentioned. Just curious about sort of just the anaerobic conditions and also the microplastics and um, generally just, you know, not so excited about plastic, um, but I don't think we'll do any more cardboard um, for that reason. We, a local farm um, traded us their excess sheep wool um, sort of like what the, the dregs of what they had from processing their wool, um, treat us that for vegetables. And so I tried it. Um, I just thought I'd compare, I put the tarps down and then I put the wool to see if it would have the same effect of shading out the weeds. Um, and it, let's see, oh, maybe it, oh, here's the, yeah, it's over here under, um, <laughs> you can see down this part of it is what was tarped with plastic. Um, and then I just pulled the wool up right here. So you can see that even though you can't see any green whatsoever under the wool, the chickweed is alive and well under it. So we'll see if the wool is, um, the, I read a, a SARE description of someone who did this trying to um, figure out if wool could work as a mulch and they had some good luck with it um, in cropping beds. So we'll see what other uses, but I would say it does not shade out weeds the way that a tarp does. Um, and like Ben said, a dog is really the only solution to um, issues with rodents. So here's Charlie um, in her winter work um, very diligently. Um, and here she is teaching um, next in line for tarp con for bowl control, Lily, this um, golden retriever puppy who literally swallows bowls whole. Um, and then of course the other drawback of tarping is, um, yeah, just the schlep, moving, moving so many heavy things around. Um, and yeah, like, like Ben said, you know, I can move a big, a big tarp, um, but it's, yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, it, I guess, you know, when you have a lot of people, it really makes sense to do it, but, um, when you don't, it's hard on the knuckles and it's um, you know, just like a lot of pulling. So it's something to consider. And of course, a lot of water collects on the, on the tarps. Um, so, let's see. 
go here. I just have a, just to, to get us in the mood for moving sandbags for the spring. <laughs> so it's a labor of love trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get ground prepared um, without tilling. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it for questions. Thank you, Jana. That was great. Uh, really appreciate your perspective. We have a, a good amount of time just on schedule here for questions. Ben's here and Peyton too. So um, Peyton, I will let you um, come through some of those questions that you have and we'll just sure. start there. Yeah, I guess, first of all, Jana, you got a kudos on all of your experimentation with those different materials. I've never even thought of or heard of using wool to occlude weeds. That's amazing. Um, I did have a quick question for you, which was, did you find the strips when you were cutting the strip, the tarps into long strips, were you finding that to be as effective as the larger area tarps that you were using? And I guess Ben, after, after Jana, I'd be curious for you as well. Yeah, we have. And um, both cutting the silage tarps into strips and also using the impermeable, or sorry, the permeable um, landscape fabric. I've found that it's just as effective both. I mean, the edge, you know, the couple inches on the edge, mm -hmm. um, like Ben was saying, he, he's found compaction. I don't know if I've found so much compaction, um, but definitely less, slightly less weed control. But that's sort of why I'm trying to um, have a couple of inches of buffer on both sides. Um, mm -hmm. of the, you know, the tarp is a little wider than the bed in going into the living mulch pad. Yeah, we, we've had a, sort of a similar thing. Uh, sort of uh, what, what Molly was saying last week, you know, there's, if there's a spot where uh, air, you know, like if you get a big bubble on the edge, if you don't have a good seal on the end, mm -hmm. you that tarp back and you realize you fit you know it's not the thing you want to see when there's everything's been uh kind of happy down there and there's that nice light green mat uh and so with the our smaller tarps we've had the same thing where it's sort of been harder to keep those edges down and so with those small ones we've pulled them back and it hasn't been you know it's like if an edge on a 10 foot tarp comes up that's a pretty big percentage of our full tarp whereas if an edge of a 50 by 60 foot tarp comes up, it feels a little more manageable. Um, but yeah, the small ones, that's sort of the, the same. As long as we can keep this, the edges sealed, the small ones have been super uh, effective. It just, you need 10 times more sandbags and there's 10 times more schlepping. And that's just like Janice said, not what we want to be doing. Ben, to follow up on that, how often or how far apart do you think you put your bags? Uh, Let's see. I mean, it's sort of the pet. We have a couple wind tunnels that are that are sort of specific to the to our field out there. And if it's in the wind tunnel, we try to put them like every four feet, which looks ridiculous when it's down there. Uh, but everywhere else, uh, it's you know, it's around eight to ten feet probably. So on you know a 50, 50 foot bed, there's I don't know six or seven tarps on the long side. Mm -hmm. I found that putting them in the pathways as well helps. Do you, do you put them in the middle or do you like to, uh, to avoid walking into the middle of the tarp and, and doing that? We'll definitely put them in the middle, especially for the big, you know, the bigger tarps, we'll definitely put them in the middle. And that definitely, and it, it helps with the big bubbles that form and sort of keeping that, keeping it down. So we definitely do that. Uh, we just had a quick question on here about what you're using to write on the tarps with. I think someone's had a hard time using Sharpie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just Sharpie. I saw that one down there too, but I'm pretty sure it's just Sharpie. We also have those garden, um, that specific brand. I don't know what it, I know like Johnny sells them, but there's a specific brand. that's not quite a Sharpie. that seems to weather a little bit better, but I'm pretty sure we just use Sharpie. Maybe you just have to let it dry for a while. Yeah. We've also used Sharpie and it's always come off. So I don't know. <laughs> Wow. Um, Jana, someone was asking what cover crop species you use for the living mulch. Um, we've just seeded clover 
um, white clover, like New Zealand white clover, mm -hmm. uh, and other stuff has showed up as well, which um, I, um, uh, I think her name is Jenny Love. Um, there's a flower farmer in Philadelphia who has a blog um, about it that um, she was saying the same thing that we've experienced, which is that um, other stuff sort of shows up in the path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other just grasses, um, which, yeah, we just mow. And when you say you mow, you just have like a regular old lawn mower, lawn mower. Yeah, we have an, um, actually we got this year, I'm excited about um, our new electric um, uh, push mower. It's a mulching okay. mower. So it, um, it chops it up small. And just leaves it there. Mm -hmm. Great. Ben, but, can, I'm going to jump in and ask about that rye cover crop. There's a question about the, the length of time that you needed to kill that crop. I know mm -hmm. that I noticed you put it down like in late April or so. Mm -hmm. How many weeks were, did you have that down for? And, and Jenny, um, you can feel that too, I guess, with, as far as killing yours. Yeah, so the rye, we definitely have found, you know, it has to be at least three weeks. I think the timing of that specific one was closer to three and a half weeks, just because that, you know, we didn't let that rye get very big. We sort of, I had hoped to plan it out a little bit better, but sort of um, in the spring, we realized we needed to plant those a little sooner than we maybe hoped when we seeded the rye in the fall. Um, and so we put the tarp on earlier than I probably would have liked, but it was three and a half weeks and it was 100%. It, there was not one rye. We didn't have any rye come up uh, uh, in that. But the, you know, that was early spring. We had a couple really sort of warmer days, if I remember right. Uh, that you know, I think that helped to even just have three or four days in a row of some good heat. I think that really pushed it along. I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that I haven't ever really killed rye with the tarp. I always just wait till it's. If, if it's in the seed production stage or the very beginning of that and we weed whack it um, or mow it, then it, yeah, then we can tarp it. Do either of you find that you're, uh, that there are more pests when you're leaving all of that cover crop residue on the ground? There is a question on here about um, wire worms in the living mulch pathways, but I guess I'm curious also about in the crop beds. Yeah, we, I mean, last year, um, last year we definitely sort of noticed, it was hard to say if it was more so in the cover copped beds than the other ones. Uh, we had a really sort of brutal grub, early spring grub and cutworm mm -hmm. uh, issues that were happening kind of everywhere. Uh, and then again, the, the cucumber beetles were really bad in that particular block there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd say we haven't like done enough sort of side by side to say, oh, this, this, these tarped ones are significantly higher than everywhere else. It sort of seems like when they're there, they're everywhere on the farm. And that's, but yeah, we haven't really noticed specifically. With the living mulch pathways, I haven't found that yet, but um, like I said, we just have a small part of the farm where we currently have the living mulch pathways. Um, and that's, we're in our second year, um, sorry, we're going into our third year with that plot having living mulch pathways. And I haven't seen an increase in wireworms um, there or other pests. I will say this doesn't really relate to tarps, but we had a, an area of the farm last year that um, we had planted the previous fall, we had planted to oats and peas, and then we let it winter kill. And then we planted, and then we tarp. And then in the spring, like right around this time of year, we went out with a big tarp and tarped the, um, de the residue of the um, oats and peas just to kind of like break it down and mm -hmm. hold the area um, until we planted spring brassicas into it in mid-April and then we had I've never actually had slugs on the farm but we had so many slugs um, from that so we haven't done that again and I don't know I, I think it was the um, the cover crop residue that we planted right into um, that caused the, the slugs. Interesting. Ryan, you found that before too, haven't you, with the slug issue? We've had slugs uh, basically driven by a 
applied mulch. So in the same way that Ken is describing the residue there that provides the habitat for the slugs, I think. And when we've tarped over top of it, we didn't find much of a, a difference. Um, but I think it was driven basically by the, by the mulch that we're applying. I wondered if you, uh, Ben, if you could talk about the rye. Um, there's a question in here about allelopathic effects. It sounds like you are just planting cucurbits and other trant plants in there. Are you, are, I mean, are you, are you direct seeding? Are you putting anything in there where you're concerned about allelopathy? And yeah, it's all, it's all been, uh, it's all transplants uh, in there. Um, and so, no, we haven't really found that issue. There have been some times where we've tried to direct seed into it and I rake the debris, you know, sort of like rake the debris so I get a good seed about or run that precision depth roller over it. Um, and we've had pretty good success. I mean, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not knowledgeable of how long that allelopathic effect sort of stays around after the rye is actually dead. Um, but it seems like, you know, again, the three and a half weeks of tarping, the, we mainly transplant cucurbits, tomatoes, and um, and brassicas and such into those no-till beds. But um, but yeah, uh, I don't notice. I was curious, Ben. It looked like are you always either mowing or weed whacking your cover crop ahead of putting a tarp over it? I guess with uh, the exception of that's the small ryegrass stand that you had. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say is that it, with the exception of that sort of small. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we if it's, you know, especially the buckwheat and oats and peas where they, you know, they get more fibrous and such. Mm -hmm. We've definitely had times when I, you know, either don't weed whack it or leave it there and they poke through or, you know, a dog runs over it. And then, they, you know, sort of those and then you have a pump tarp. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, we try to we try to mat it down the best we can. I mean, if, you know, and if that's like sort of the more rolling crimping or mowing, just some way to sort of flatten it before we get the tarp out. We have a question about um, if you've had luck with any other kind of rodent control besides your dogs. I mean, we set so many traps in the tunnels, you know? Um, yeah. And they sometimes work, sometimes don't. But yeah, in terms of under the tarps, um, no. <laughs> we have a lot of birds of prey. And so that, you know, once it's sort of opened up a couple, you know, I sort of feel like after a, a week or two, either the dog or the birds or something is uh, usually taking care of them. Jen, I wanted to follow up on your mowing of the rye and the vetch and then letting the vetch regrow. How have you tinkered with that system to help the rot, the, the vet tree grow or do you, where do you mow it at what height or what do you think is important to help the vet kind of take off and dominate the rye? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, just the timing, the timing, like getting the rye um, really once it's already um, settled into that seed production stage, it doesn't have to have the, um, you know, the grain head out just that it's like getting uh, milky in there and then yeah mowing it, it we didn't even mow it that high probably um, you know just with a regular brush mower um, on the tractor and uh, yeah and then the the rye just pops back up and I've done that for years um, even before tarping um, just as a way to to get the benefit of having the vetch in long enough to flower. Did you find the tarp the was killing the vetch. It looked like in that one picture where you had the weeds kind of coming up through the, the mulch, or that residue, you also had some flowering vetch in there still, or what were your experiences yeah, that was, killing vetch? That was an example where we literally just had weed whacked the cover crop and planted directly into it. So we didn't tarp that at all. This year, I'm gonna, for exactly that reason, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna see if I can squeeze two weeks of tarping in on, on a similar plot um, because we just had so much stuff sprouting back. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll let you know how it goes. I think um, it still was really interesting. We didn't have annual weeds coming up in that plot, 
or anything that was going to seed in a way that um, made me nervous. So, and like I said, the yield was actually the same on the tilled area and the area that didn't look very, <laughs> very aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> There's a question asking how you uh, repair holes in tarps. I guess at what point do you, do you call it a day on a tarp as well? We, yeah, I'll go ahead. No, you go ahead. We, uh, if there's a hole, we have, uh, what? If it's like a big hole and it's already out and we're not about to roll that up and get a new one to put out, uh, we've used like we've used like rolls and then binder clips, which is like a temporary um, kind of thing. We've sort of been experimenting with our row cover um, using uh, the eight inch staples with a binder clip, just like office, you know, like office binder clip ones, whatever the bigger ones are. Mm -hmm. uh, thread the uh, squeezer part of that through the ground staple. The ground staple goes in and then you can pinch the remay over the hoop. Um, we've had pretty good success with that, actually. And so somehow binder clips have become a pretty big part of our farm. That's awesome. Um, we, we do have this black tape. Um, I can't remember where we bought it from. When we, um, maybe Farmer's Friend. Um, I'm not sure, but it, it's a black tape that's like a tarp, and we can just tarp up any holes. Um, <laughs> or tape up any holes, but I usually leave them actually. I kind of like that a little bit of water can get under there. Like I said, we're on a gentle slope and I sort of worry about this big wide swath of area where no water can go. Um, so yeah, I don't really mind a few holes. Yeah, I completely agree. The smaller holes we, we leave, it's really the like bigger ones where the, it seems like the wind sort of gets mm -hmm. in the bigger and bigger but those smaller holes like you know we have a lot of deer over the winter even though we have a deer fence uh and they definitely poke hole you know they sort of poke mm -hmm. holes scratch around and those sort of smaller holes we leave until um, they get bigger we just have a minute or two left here Peyton um mm -hmm. any other there's a question a while back about using white on white tarps. It was repurposed from something I can't remember, but do either have you either of you used those? Just using the black and white on one side, on each side. Yeah, yeah I'm always I'm curious black. about that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be curious to know. I'd be super curious if people use the white side up for any particular reason. We use, I, I could, could, could say that we do, one other use we have for our tarps is that we have very limited infrastructure. And so we use, we cut one tarp to just go over our propagation house. So with that one, we have the white side up. So once we're done with uh, the main sort of propagation house stuff and we're curing garlic and onions, we'll cover the propagation house with the white side. And then it creates, it, we, we've had amazing luck curing. Um, that's the perfect conditions for curing in there. Awesome. I just see one question at the very top, uh, Ben, about the buckwheat rotation. Mm -hmm. um, you may have spoken to this, but what comes after the buckwheat and have you ever seeded anything directly into that buckwheat? Another, uh, another cover crop, another buckwheat crop, or, or how, does, how, do, how does the tarp and the buckwheat system work? Yeah, so we'll, I sort of said this earlier, I, we'll do a early spring, you know, that'll be like for early spring crops. Uh, once those come out, we'll put a buckwheat after that. Uh, and then we'll try to, you know, let that flower for a bit, weed whack it, put the tarp down, and then try to get either another round of sort of shorter season fall, uh, fall stuff on there, or we'll do that one sort of right into winter rye. Uh, and that, that really depends on what we've got planned for the, for the next year. But, um, but yeah, the, the buckwheat has been great. And I saw, I think I saw a question there too, is if we've ever tried putting buckwheat on top of buckwheat, like let the buckwheat go, take it down, do buckwheat again. Um, we haven't tried that, but that sounds pretty mm -hmm. sweet. Would you, in that rye system, would you direct seed into that residue from the buckwheat after you pull the tarp off or? Yeah, we've actually done that, but that, you know, that involves raking. So, you know, we would rake, we would do that. And then the buckwheat, you know, is so sort of shallow, it's really easy to create a pretty nice seed bed uh, without tillage 
with the buckwheat and then you know you're, you're mulching the pads and um, but yeah we've direct seeded into buckwheat stubble and it's been really successful great well i wanted to uh honor the time uh unless there's any other uh burning comments from ben or jenna something that we left off that you wanted to comment on i don't think so just appreciate the effort putting this together yeah, well, this is uh, this has been really, really good, really excellent, great perspectives. I uh, thank both Ben and Jenna for joining, uh, for everyone uh, for signing in today. And uh, I did post in the uh, chat an evaluation that hopefully you guys can give us some feedback. We want to keep conversations going and and um, get your feedback, learn from this, and know what to offer into the future, and hopefully uh, bring others uh, to share what's working for them on their farm. Uh, please do tune in, uh, tune in for next week. Same time will be our third webinar in the series. And uh, I thank you all very much for joining today. And I hope you got something out of it. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.